Good evening, everyone, both to our in-person and our virtual audience joining us over Zoom. My name is Ben Jones. I am the Assistant Director of the Rock Ethics Institute. I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight for this panel on Tony Bertelli's book, Democracy Administered, How Public Administration Shapes Representative Government. We have a terrific panel of experts whom you will meet shortly. Um, but first, I want to thank the sponsors for tonight's event, the School of Public Policy, the University Libraries, and the Rock Ethics Institute. There are also several individuals I want to give a special shout out to for all their work behind the scenes organizing tonight's event. Um, in particular, Whitney Sheridan with the School of Public Policy, Tammy Hosterman also with the School of Public Policy, and then in the University Libraries, Nani Schlotzauer here, and also Andrew Dudash. We are very fortunate to have, us, have with us today Clarence Lang, the uh, Susan Welch Dean of the College of the Liberal Arts. Here in the Rock Ethics Institute, our faculty keep publishing books, and Dean Lane kindly keeps agreeing to come to these Author Meets Critics events, support our faculty, and participate in them, which we appreciate a great deal. Um, so I'd like to invite to the stage Dean Lane to give the welcome for tonight's event. Okay, thank you, Ben. Um, and good, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, with you all. My remarks are brief, um, but I just want to welcome you to this evening's event. Uh, we will be discussing Professor Tony Bertelli's most recent book, Democracy Administered. Um, it was a coup uh, for our college to bring Professor Bertelli to Penn State shortly after launching the School of Public Policy around 2018. Uh, Tony, the Sherwin Whitmore Professor of the Liberal Arts is one of the leading scholars in the field of public administration. Uh, his research has appeared in the top academic journals and presses in his field, and he is the recipient of numerous awards. And for those of you who are undergraduates here, because I, I heard mention of a, of a class, this is in part the importance of being at a research uh, university that you get to interact uh, with leading scholars in their respective fields. So uh, I'm glad you're taking advantage of it. Find other ways to, to do so. Uh, notably, Tony's research highlights the role that the liberal arts can play in informing and advancing our knowledge of public administration and public policy. To do that, he draws on a range of tools, ranging from statistical analysis to political philosophy to explore what role democratic values play and should play in informing the work of public servants and government agencies. I hope I don't have to, to tell you um, that given uh, the current threats to, and I think we can say it bluntly like that, in attacks on democracy as practice and um, as, as, as process, both here and abroad, uh, such research is especially critical and timely. Indeed, Many aspects of our democratic systems need attention and strengthening because democracy is not a thing. It really is processes and procedures. In fact, bureaucracy um, in some cases, um, which I don't use as a bad word. Um, Tony skillfully brings attention to how democratic values can flourish or be stymied in residents' interactions with the state, including those interactions that are seemingly mundane. Um, let me say too, uh, that I'm grateful to the distinguished scholars who have been gathered this evening to reflect on the themes raised by Tony's work. Leanne Benesak, professor and head of the Department of Political Science. John Chrisman, professor of philosophy, political science and women's studies and director of the Penn State Humanities Institute. And our guest from UC Berkeley, Professor Sean Gilmart, a faculty member in the Charles and Louise Travers Department of Political Science, um, who you will hear from shortly. Uh, this panel is part of an ongoing series organized by the Rock Ethics Institute to highlight books published by the Institute's faculty. And yes, I will continue to come and give welcomes as, as these books come out. Um, I've attended a number of these events um, and I immensely uh, truly value the role that the Rock and his leadership play in building community in our college and beyond. And, and Ben is, of course, part of that, that leadership as well. Um, and I hope that you all will, will agree that in addition to conducting research uh, 
um, we should make time to celebrate and reflect on the scholarship of our, of our faculty. And I thank the Rock Ethics Institute for creating forums to do just that. Um, given the range of themes covered in Tony's book, the discussion that follows should be of interest to scholars and students of public administration, those with an interest in these topics, um, as well as anyone with an interest in seeing democracy function better. Uh, so I'm happy to hand things back to Ben to introduce our, our panelists. I'm gonna stay for a little bit, not that you all care, but I'll say this, but at a certain point I'll need to, to slip out for some other mundane sorts of things <laughs> that I need to do in my role. But um, thank you all for your attention and for being here this evening. And I'll hand things back over to Ben. Thank you, Clarence. No, I go ahead. Thank you. So let me uh, give very brief um, introduction to our interdisciplinary panel and some of the research that they work on. Um, our first panelist, as you've already are aware, is Tony Bertelli, the author of Democracy Administered. He is uh, holds the Douglas S. and Joyce L. Sherwin Chair of Liberal Arts, honoring Frank Whitmore. He's the author of six books, and I'm, I'm sure that number will grow in the near future. And his research on public administration has received the Herbert Simon Award from the Midwest Political Science Association, as well as has received support from the European Research Council. Also with us is Sean Gilmard um, from UC Berkeley. His book with John Patty, Learning While Governing, Expertise and Accountability in the Executive Branch, won not one but two awards from the American Political Science Association, the William H. Riker Prize from the Political Economy Section, and the Herbert A. a. Simon Prize from the Public Administration Section. He currently is working on a book project entitled Agents of Empire, English Imperial Governance and the Making of American Political Institutions, which will be published by Cambridge University Press. Also with us is Leanne Banizak, Professor of Political Science, Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies, head of the Penn State Department of Political Science. She's an expert on social movements and has written ex extensively on women's movements throughout history and into the present day. Her books include The Women's Movement, Inside and Outside the State, published by Cambridge University Press, and Why Movements Succeed or Fail, Opportunity, Culture, and the Struggle for Women's Suffrage, published by Princeton University Press. And finally with us is John Chrisman, Professor of Philosophy, Political Science, and Women's Studies, and also Director of the Humanities Institute here at Penn State. His research focuses on competing understandings of freedom, social conceptions of the self, and theories of justice and oppression. His books include The Politics of Persons, Individual Autonomy, and Socio-Historical Selves, published by Cambridge University Press, and The Myth of Property, Toward an Egalitarian Theory of Ownership, published by Oxford University Press. So we will proceed as follows. Each of the critics will share their remarks on democracy administered. Uh, Tony will have an opportunity to respond and then we'll open it up for questions from you as well as our virtual audience. So with that, I will hand it off to Sean to lead us off. Thank you. Uh, stay seated here. Whichever, if you want to come up, you'll just have to bring the mic, whichever I'm you prefer. Here. Okay. That's okay? Yeah. Okay, how's the volume? Great, thank you. Thanks a lot for everybody for being here. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to join you uh, and to join Tony. Um, and uh, it was a pleasure to, I was reading this book anyway, had already read it, pleasure to come here and talk about it. Um, I've known Tony for quite a long time, almost as long as I've been in this business, right? Um, and, uh, and it's been a pleasure to, uh, you know, keep in touch with him, see his work develop and grow over time and see the impact it has had uh, on the discipline that we share. Uh, I am a political scientist by training and that's where I hold my appointment, but a, a good portion of my work does focus on public administration. Um, and, uh, and so one of the things I want to do as a critic of this book is kind of explain what I think is the big point of it, because there is one. It's a really big point. It's an important one. Um, and, and then, explain, and then uh, give some thoughts about uh, some of the foundations of the argument that Tony makes in this book. Okay, so the big point, if I could summarize it, I would call it Bertelli's Razor. Uh, Bertelli's razor is uh, uh, like Occam's razor. It's one of these razors you can use to shave off arguments about 
how systems work. Bertelli's razor, if, you, if I may, is that there is no normative free lunch in policy work and public administration. And this is a really significant point as we train our students and engage them as professionals to understand their role in the public policy process in a democracy, which is, as Tony says in this book, democracy administered. The reason for Bertelli's razor that there's no normative free, uh, no normative free lunch in public administration is that all policy work involves value trade-offs. And this is inherent in the kind of work that happens in politics and happens in the administration of policy. There are values that cannot all always be satisfied. And then when we pursue, when we decide a subset of values to pursue, we have to make an argument about why this one? Why are we prioritizing these, privileging these particular values or objectives over some other ones? And it is not the case in the work that administrators and policy workers do that some of them are just plain obvious or good. If it seems like that, return to Bertelli's razor. There is no normative free lunch. There must be something you're giving up. And if you haven't found it yet, keep looking. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, and so what Tony seeks to do in this book goes to the soul of public administration as a discipline. And in my opinion, as somebody in a cognate field and adjacent to it, to the discipline of public administration for 20 years, it's a soul that public administration sometimes doesn't have the tightest connection to, and the, and the field needs it. The field needs to maintain this connection to this core point that it is uh, uh, its purpose is not to eliminate the value judgments of administrators. It is to ground them in some kind of public values that can make them defensible and make the public administrative system work as democracy administered. So that is what Tony is trying to do in this book. And the core of the book, or one of the core of it, because it there's a lot of meat in here uh, once you start to really uh, get into it. But one of the cores of this book is to understand or unpack how the nature of the value trade-offs that policy workers face in their administrative functions depends on how organizational structure embeds values, public values of accountability and process in public decision-making. It's that not every organization embeds these values in the same way. Some organizations, uh, public organizations, administrative organizations are built with the direct connection to values of accountability to administrators. Some of them are built with insulation from administrators from the process of public accountability. And the dilemmas and the challenges that administrators and policy workers face for grounding their value judgments and trade-offs differ across these contexts. So for the practitioner, Tony's analysis in this book is essential for unpacking how to think through the ethical dilemmas and value trade-offs that policy workers face as they attempt to do good for society in each of these contexts. It's a really important contribution, is not one that has appeared in this literature. And like I said, it reaches and touches the soul of public administration. Because what, as a, somebody who studied public administration in graduate school, at the professional level, as well as partially in my PhD work, uh, it's always been apparent to me that the core of that field has to instill this sense of ethical conduct. And the reason is because there is no way to alleviate value trade-offs in policy work. So that is the core of the message that Tony offers here. If it's going to work at all, it has to be grounded in the values of the public system in which administrators, uh, uh, in which administrators act. And the way to accomplish that grounding takes us to uh, another point that I wanted to delve into, which is the idea of administrative responsibility. Okay, so as, as, I, as I mentioned, one of Tony's key points one of the most important points original to this book is that the problem of, uh, of making value trade-offs and value judgments is inescapable 
uh, for policy workers and administrators. The, the uh, uh, Democracy Administered, Tony's book, emphasizes the democratic trilemma, uh, you know, a concept in the field of social choice theory as a foundation for this. Uh, as with all, as Tony knows, as with all problems of social choice theory about the possible incoherence of majority rule and so forth, these problems go away with enough homogeneity in society. So one of the things that I wanted to emphasize is that the problem of administrative responsibility and structuring it, using it in a principled way, still doesn't go away, even if these kinds of social choice problems are eliminated. And the reason is that delegation from legislators, from elected officials to administrators and policy workers can never be, so to speak, a complete contract. There will always be contingencies that arise in administrative work that cannot be foreseen in the design of legislation, in stipulating in a law every single thing that an administrator is supposed to do. And this is important because stretching back 80 years now into one of the uh, core pillars of how people have thought about how to structure policy work and make it responsible, one school of thought is simply to say, have a legislature specify every single thing an administrator could possibly do in any contingency that could arise. Just have them think about everything that could possibly happen and specify what an administrator is supposed to do in all of them. And then you will remove the problem of administrative discretion. And every decision that's made by public, uh, by, by a public organization will be accountable through the, through the electoral process and the political process. And the problem with this argument is not just the democratic trilemma of instability of majority rule and so forth that Tony identifies, it's that delegation is in fact never a complete contract. So as long as there is any disagreement of value among uh, values among participants in society, there will be opportunities when administrative structures are created and there are unforeseen events that occur, there will be opportunities for administrators to use their discretion in ways to pursue their values, what they see as the good, even if it is not robustly determined as the good by the public. Uh, so there's always the possibility uh, that, this, uh, that, this that, this, uh, uh, that this issue arises. And I believe it's even more fundamental than perhaps what is it, uh, than, than the, the support for it and democracy administered. The way out of it, uh, the way to reconcile this is uh, has to do with the concept that Tony calls value reinforcement. The idea of value reinforcement is expressed in this book. It's one of the really generative new ideas in this book that I think will carry an empirical and a normative literature among scholars going forward for some time, the idea of value reinforcement is that political systems embed certain values like pluralism, the idea that society consists of a number of disparate groups. And as long as they all get a say, they get to say their ideas in, so to speak, the public square and they hear each other out, we can come to perhaps some uh, better understanding of each other and some common good. Uh, or majoritarianism being another one that uh, whatever you know whatever a, a, if there is sort of a robust enough majority that favors a particular type of action then it is per se a normatively desirable action these are the kinds of values political values that a political system embeds and different systems embed different ones these values also propagate to the governance systems, the administrative structures through which policy is administered, the places where policy workers engage and hammer out the substance of public programs and make them effective. So this idea of value reinforcement means that the values at the political systemic level propagate to the administrative or the governance level. Uh, and 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 they uh, so what happens in society gets propagated through to the administrative side. Now this, on the one hand, helps to give a solid normative foundation for administrative work. On the other hand, it means that administrative work, policy work, must be conservative in some sense, in the sense of accepting the fundamental value commitments of the society rather than challenging. That is, as I read it, a part of the argument uh, of value reinforcement. And there's both an ought 
claim in this and an is claim. There's both a, a, a positive statement and a normative aspect of this claim of value reinforcement. And there are a number of mechanisms of this process that Tony conjectures and that will need to be sorted out uh, by other scholarship. Uh, uh, one point I wanted to raise is the possibility as we identify the existence of value reinforcement is the possible complication of dynamics over time as the values in a political system change. Uh, because they do. Sometimes political value in a long-lived system, you know, a system that lives long enough, political values will change over time. But one thing we know about institutional cultures and institutional structures is that they are sticky. They don't respond instantaneously to changes from their political overseers above them. And we've spent decades in political science studying why this is the case. Uh, and so this raises a possibility as we see value change at the, at the level of a political system, how long does it take to propagate to value change at the level of governance system? Because the idea of value reinforcement is that there's a conjunction between, they have to match at some level. And I think if I read this, if I extend this to a dynamic concept, if they don't match, if the values at the political level and the governance level don't match, those systems are in disequilibrium. And there's going to be some conflict to make them come back into equilibrium. As long as that process is working out, and it may be a very long-term process, it could still be working out by the time the political values have changed again, because those aren't static, uh, it, it, it makes it harder to tell if there's actually a disconnect between contemporary values in the political system and those in the governance system. Meaning that, you know, to an empirical analyst, it gives you another degree of freedom. If you wanna say, if you wanna look at the, if you wanna look at a political system and say, yes, a governance system's values match it, the possibility of dynamic change and slow adjustment gives you another degree of freedom to say, even though they're not quite in sync right now, you know, they're, it's, it's because of the slow dynamic adjustment. So it gives a degree of freedom that I think is that empirical literature goes forward, uh, you'll want to, people will want to pay attention to to make sure they're appropriately uh, careful about. How am I doing on time? Great. Okay, so I wanted to make one more point uh, about what I think is really the robustness of this argument, which is the underlying model of a democratic system that's uh, leveraged in this book. And Tony spends a lot of time in the book unpacking how democracy works in order to do, and by that I mean electoral democracy and, and political democracy that connects voters and their elected officials. And so there's, there's kind of this, you know, sort of uh, underlying idea of a transmission belt of, of values from voters, elected officials, policy workers, administrators, and so forth, okay? And so how that, each step of that process works is an important step of the analysis. And Tony spends a lot of time unpacking one particular constructive model of how the uh, uh, democratic accountability works between elected official representatives and their voters. And it is based on, again, a, a longstanding model of electoral sanctioning by voters. Politicians do the things that they do. They stand in front of voters and say, what did you think? If the voters don't like it, they vote against them. It's a straightforward, robust model. It's got its problems, but it, it has a lot going for it. Uh, the point that I wanted to ask about is, does the analysis in this book, does the core point of what you refer to as the champion's dilemma, the fundamental problem of causal inference, uh, I'm sorry, I'm so used to that phrase, the fundamental problem of public administration, um, uh, do uh, those concepts that remind us that there is always a value trade-off in what administrators do, do they actually depend on that model or are they more robust than that? And I am not convinced that they're not a little bit more robust. I am not convinced that you need that specific model uh, of democracy in order to make this argument work, um, in order to deliver what this book actually delivers to students and scholars of public administration. Um, and and uh, and so we we could talk perhaps a bit more about that. Um, and I think that's important because there are quite, you know one can question the sanctioning model in a lot of ways. And you present a model. The book presents a model by which policy workers are accountable to representatives by explaining value choices, by giving reasons, by deliberation, by narration. 
all of that happens in the accountability process between uh, policy workers and representatives. But as described in the democratic model in the book, it doesn't happen between representatives and voters. And so what I'm saying is even if it did, even if, that mo even if that accountability model that is applied in the book to policy workers also scaled to elected officials, the fundamental problem of public administration remains, which is there is no normative free lunch. And so as we teach our students uh, entering public service about how to advance the values of the public, we should instill in them the major lesson of this book, which is what, what I took from it or at least one implication of it is, if you look at an administrative action that is complicated and multifaceted, and as an administrator or policy worker, you look at it and say, nope, this one seems normatively obvious. Here is a thing that I can do as an administrator, and there is only good and no bad. If that is what you believe about the action you're about to take, go back to Bertelli's razor, because there's something else on the other side of that choice that you got to think some more about uh, and really understand and make an argument about. So the book is ultimately uh, liberating, I think, for public servants in that it frees up the possibility of this important value creation that they can do uh, provided it rests on solid foundations. And so by tackling this problem uh, of, of placing the, the exercise of administrative discretion of policy workers on a really solid foundation, this book takes, I think, the most important normative step uh, towards the concept of democracy administered that I've seen from the public administration literature in a very long time. So it was a pleasure to read it. Thanks for the opportunity uh, and look forward to the other comments. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Leanne? So first of all, thank you for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to speak about democracy administered. And I'm really happy to see students here. I'm happy to see scholars here. And I'm happy to see members of the general public here um, to talk about democracy and its link to public administration. So I have to admit, when I was first invited, I struggled a bit about whether or not to accept. Um, after all, my area of expertise is far from the fields connected to in this book. I'm neither a normative theorist, nor am I a positive theorist. And none of my, uh, not my research isn't really central to public administration either. And even within political science, my area of research really doesn't connect to the selection of representatives, uh, po political parties and elections that's so central to Professor Bertelli's conception of democracy. So my focus is on social movements and their role in democracy and on the extension of political rights. And if there's any connection to what I do, it's in a 2010 book um, on women's movement activists who worked for the federal government, where I argue that the boundary line between citizens and public administration is maybe not as clear as we like to hold it. So my perspective on democracy administered is that of an outsider to the field and the literature. Um, but one I think that's actually vital uh, to understanding the role of public administration in democracy. So I want to start out by lauding what Tony has done in this book, because I agree with Sean. It's, it's really an amazing book. As he notes, most of the debate about administering democracy has emphasized the tension between elected representatives' control of public administration and the need to administer uh, public policy effectively. Tony makes a major contribution to our understanding of public policy by arguing that we need to look at public administrators' discretionary freedom and that they have a responsibility to reinforce democ democratic values. He adds to this fueling tension about how much control representatives have and the need for expert policy workers to have autonomy to create uh, effective policy with that third consideration. Public, administers, public administration needs to focus on influencing basic democratic values. And he labels this the champion's dilemma. So that's the language in the book rather than Bertelli's razor. I want to make two points in discussing democracy administered. First, I wanna talk a little bit about the actors in the book and who they are 
And second, I want to not only agree with uh, Tony's argument that focusing on public administration reinforcement of values is important, but I also want to suggest that the power of public administrators to reinforce values goes deeper and further than his argument implies. So let me start with the first point. Tony's book, like all good books, starts by introducing the cast of characters. In the first chapter, Tony lays out four important sets of actors in democracy. Representatives, those chosen by the voters in competitive elections to produce legislation. Policy workers, those individuals who are implementing the laws that representatives make. Managers or administrators, who are policy workers who have discretion about how to utilize resources to implement the laws. And importantly, from Tony's perspective, determine the degree to which those policies are gonna reinforce democratic values. And finally, the champions who advocate for particular ways that pol public policy should be done. Now, these are not mutually exclusive categories. Managers are also policy workers. And importantly, champions can fall into any of these categories or simply be interested stakeholders. Although Tony draws the distinction between champions and policy entrepreneurs, those people who are advocating for a specific policy solution. I'm gonna to return to champions at the end, but from my perspective, there is another actor that has a starring role, but doesn't get the same introduction in the first chapter. And that group is citizens. Not, who are nonetheless central to the work. Despite the lack of top billing, citizens play a central role throughout the book. In chapter two, um, Sean's kind of indicated this, uh, Tony argues that citizens are able to hold their representatives accountable through sanctioning, assuring that, policy cre uh, that the policy created uh, reflects their values. In chapter three, Tony introduces Three democratic values labeled process values, pluralism, majoritarianism are the ones Sean mentioned. He also talks about collective rationality and establishes that European citizens' appraisals of these values influence their beliefs about the way their democracy is functioning. Chapter four compares different possible forms of public administration, noting that some forms can really hinder democratic accountability or these process values, even while they allow for greater citizen input. And then in the final two chapters of the book, the citizens move a little bit into the background as Tony focuses on the importance of value reinforcement in public administration. Although I would argue the citizens continue to motivate the entire democratic process, even as he grounds, uh, especially because he grounds his uh, public administrative argument in theories of the state. While Tony's focus is on how public administration shapes representative government through the values expressed in the policy process, I would argue that one implication of the book is that reinforcing democratic values is also important to administrating democracy because citizens respond to the perceived values inherent in the policies when evaluating their representatives and their democracy more generally. So given the centrality of citizens in democracy, I personally would have liked to see citizens get the same careful attention that other actors receive. We're told they select representatives in elections. Um, we're told that policy workers and managers are themselves citizens, but we know scant little more about them. So why is it important to think carefully about citizens? First, the book implies that the only democratic way citizens have input into policy is through the representatives they choose. That seems to me uh, an overly narrow view of citizenship. Let me explain why. So my first worry is that the assumptions that citizens have input into policy through elections doesn't always hold. So when I consider the US democracy, um, I consider the democracy we have today to be better at allowing citizen input into policy than say 60 years ago, and certainly more than 120 years ago. Um, but in point of fact, not everyone who lives in the democracy gets to choose representative. So we don't allow citizens under 18 to vote, although I'm sure almost everyone in this 
audience can think of some smart and engaged teenagers that probably would do a good job. Only two states currently allow those incarcerated for a felony to vote. And in half of the states, that restriction continues even once these citizens serve their time. Finally, in over 20% of the states, you can be denied the right to choose representatives if you don't carry a particular card in your pocket when you go to vote. In addition, institutional processes also dilute the ability of citizens to select representatives. Here, things like the drawing of gerrymandered districts make a difference. Uh, wasted votes are a well-known feature of many uh, political systems in the US and also multi-party systems. In addition, Tony's conception of democracy also limits, I feel, the possibilities for historical change. Although I have to admit that Sean gave us one mechanism for that. I worry that a definition of democracy that accepts as unchanging or given the institutions and processes that empower representatives doesn't allow us to move from the citizenry of 120 years ago to the present day. In Tony's careful analysis of the relationship between representatives on the one hand and managers and policy workers on the other, citizens and democratic institutions are exogenous to the most important political processes. And the only choice for champions is to support representatives, to encourage efficient uh, management, or to uphold existing democratic values, which he discusses mainly as pluralism, majoritarianism, and collective rationality. While the book leaves room for reinforcing the existing strengths of electoral democracies, it is generally critical of other ways of promoting wider roles for citizens in the, in the process of policymaking because of the effect they have on that link of accountability between representatives and citizens and representatives and, and policy. But is it not possible that champions could be advocates of reform of the system themselves? Many of the key expansions of our democracy have arisen in response to organized social movements who worked not only through elected representatives, and I would say not mainly through elected representatives, but also pursued goals through initiatives and through the courts. So if I'm so critical of the assumptions underlying this theory, I am enthusiastic about the book's central premise that the solution to the dilemma described above for managers and champions is to recognize that they need to reinforce democratic principles and processes when they create policy. Tony argues very persuasively that it is a moral responsibility of public administration to reinforce democratic values as long as they provide policy true to the representative stated intent. He believes that managers and policy workers can do this within the discretion that any piece of legislation. My own work on women's movement activists within the US government demonstrates this. Feminist managers and policy workers followed Tony's dictum, always pursuing the legislative intent and emphasizing pluralism and majoritarian values in their policy work even when they disagree. For example, they assured that different uh, citizen groups were informed about government policy and utilizing discretion to write policies in gender neutral uh, language. But that wasn't all that those policy workers did. Um, for those activists, they were not only uh, viewed themselves as responsible in their roles as policy workers and managers, but they also were strongly attached to their role as citizens, albeit not through the democratic process. So for those feminist activists working within the state, they sometimes organized against policies at night that they faithfully executed during the day. These feminist activists also recognized that public administration's power to reinforce values was stronger than Tony acknowledged. So Tony talks about the importance of reinforcing democratic values for our democratic institutions. But I would also argue 
that reinforcing those democratic values also affects citizens' preferences about their democratic institution. And this can be a positive for democratic institutions, but it also means that we need to be vigilant about the power of democracy administered. And that's because um, if state policy can affect other values as well, if citizens are affected by the responsible actions policymakers, then the, their uh, values themselves are not independent. So I had more to say, but I wanted to return at the end to the champion, the actor who considers these dilemmas and advocates for a particular solution. I have to admit, um, when I read the book, the champion was the most opaque character I met. Uh, and this is less of a critique of Tony than perhaps my own lack of imagination. But while Tony gives specific examples of uh, representatives, managers, policy workers, he doesn't do the same for the champion. So if I were to leave us with one final thought tonight about the champion who must advocate for solutions, I'm going to rely on the words of Freddie Mercury. We are the champion. Thank you, Leanne. John? Thank you. Um, I also want to express my gratitude for being invited um, to participate in this gathering. Uh, when I met Tony, I knew we had a lot to talk about and I had a lot to learn from him. So it was a delight to be able to not only read his work, but engage in it and have this rich conversation about it. Now, there's a great deal to praise about Tony Bertelli's complex and tightly argued book. For someone like me, a political theorist who is relatively new to the public administration literature, there was a great deal to learn from this work. My comments here will likely miss many of the subtleties and precision in the models Tony develops and the claims he uses to make he <clears throat> uses them to make, but I want to raise some questions motivated by attention to democratic theory that perhaps might help in Tony's further thinking about these important questions. Now, it won't be necessary at this point in the discussion to summarize the main arguments uh, of the book, but I do want to re reiterate a couple of key claims so as to make sure that my comments are, are apt. Two of the major theses of the book, as we've heard, are that policy workers cannot avoid trade-offs in using whatever discretion they're allowed in, in a given governing structure, and they should aim to reinforce the democratic values inherent in those structures in using that discretion. Tony also provides an important model for distinguishing such structures and the values they tend to enhance or obviate. The overall point can be summed up, summed up by saying that policy workers and managers of public administration cannot shy away from balancing considerations, but should work to shore up democracy itself in making these balancing decisions. Now, Tony is very precise in delineating the values attached to the differing governing structures he lists including accountability values, um, which work through uh, both prospective selection of officials and retrospective sanctioning of them, and process values of pluralism, majoritarianism, and collective rationality. These values cut across the various functions that democratic institutions and practices are meant to exercise, such as the aggregation of citizens' interests, the protection of equal political standing, and the collective will formation of deliberative publics. Accountability uh, is crucial to these functions as it connects representatives to citizens, both at the level of will, manifesting democracy as a form of collective self-government, and at the level of information about people's preferences and interests. Procedural integrity, process values, connects to a democracy's capacity to include all its constituents in the calculation of collective will, and citizens' interests, as well as protecting equal standing of, of participants through open access to electrical, electoral processes and the equal weighing of interests through fair voting procedures. These are values that democratic societies have committed themselves to at the constitutional level, as Tony argues. Notice, however, that in my gloss of the democratic functions and the values attached to them, a list of quite, quite differing value frameworks has been presented in describing the normative foundations for democracies. The enumeration reflects the different ways that theorists have formulated 
the normative core of democratic institutions, a list about which these theorists have proffered countless arguments, critiques, and defenses. That is, the way that policy workers might be moved to carry out the responsible exercise um, of their authority, if they are to follow uh, the directive of Tony's value reinforcement principle, for example, may well depend on the details of the broader framework of democracy, its essence and its normative foundation that they see as, no, as uh, most compelling to the extent to which they inform their reflection by reading democratic theory. <clears throat> but let me explain. There are a variety of models of democracy, each of which bespeaks of not only its central function and architecture, but also by implication or explicitly the normative considerations that justify democracy as a form of governance. The three models I want to lay out briefly are these, democracy as collective self-government, democracy as an aggregation of interests, and democracy as a manifestation and protector of structural equality. I can't go into detail about the prov providence of these approaches, but to orient people's thinking, we can say this about them. Democracy as self-government can be said to rest on a lineage that runs roughly from Rousseau to Habermas and is based on the idea of the autonomy of a free people, namely the expression of their collective will to generate the law that constrains them. This involves a process of collective will formation that requires deliberation and citizen input directly or through mediating institutions like political parties, interest groups, and so on. Democracy as interest aggregation arises from, on the one hand, Hobbesian premises about the conception of the social good as nothing over and above the subjectively formed individual preferences of its members. And on the other, the utilitarian and later social choice idea that the maximization of preference satisfaction amalgamated through voting produces that social good. And finally, democracy as equality expresses the idea that only majoritarian practices of representative mechanisms preserve the equal social standing that citizens ought to enjoy, uh, a framework that finds its dominant recent expression in Rawls, but can be seen in other thinkers such as Ronald Dworkin, Elizabeth Anderson, and Thomas Cristiano, whom Tony cites. Tony knows these competing framework well, as he mentions them briefly at times, as I'll discuss. But apparently he doesn't think that the contrast among them affects his conclusions directly. At least this appears to be the case as Tony only touches on these contrasting framework, frameworks in passing, implying that the structure and implementation of his model of public administration is completely ecumenical, ecumenical about such theoretical conflicts. But I'd like to raise the question of whether this is so. For the sake of time, I'll only talk about the first two of these models in order to make a more general point that contrasts among frameworks for defining and justifying democracy may well affect the ways that democratic values of the sort, of the sort Tony describes <clears throat> can be reinforced by champions as well as policy workers and managers. Democracy of self, as self-government is tied most closely to a deliberative approach to democratic practice and electoral structures. Seeing democratic outcomes as the product of collective will formation requires there to be mechanisms of discussion and cooperative exchange in various publics, public spheres in which politics is enacted. This multi-directional exchange of information and opinion both contributes to electoral selection, but importantly infor informs later deliberations of issues and policy formulations at least in principle. Seeing both electoral outcomes and policy development as shaped by public discussion enables us to see democratic processes as the, man as the manifestation of a collective will. Tony makes reference to such considerations during his discussion of process values and the role of deliberation in shaping policy. He specifically looks at techniques such as deliberative polling and other formations of mini publics but notes problems of legitimacy and accountability in these processes because of the limitations of pluralism, that is public participation in the selection of participants. Additionally, in his discussion of representative agency, one of the governance structures he describes, Tony notes that direct citizen input in policy formations can occur 
<clears throat> and the participatory budget, budgeting processes used in Brazil is discussed as an example, but that such deliberations take place only among elites rather than citizens generally, and do so in policy circles that are delinked from representatives. And so accountability of the latter for such decisions is weakened. Now, such problems are well noted, though the view that broader processes of public deliberation during campaigns, as well as legislative uh, deliberation in the passage of policy instruments, can inform later exercises of, of policy worker discretion, can gain a foothold in the view of democracy as collective will formation. The view that, that democracy is ideally an expression of collective self-government, exercised by way of public deliberation, should shape the way managers and policy workers see their roles in making trade-offs among values that Tony rightly insists they must do. This framework also can be used to highlight the important role that extra-governmental institutions play in the enhancement or obviation of democratic values, the most prominent of, prominent of which is the media. Both local and ma national mass media have great effect on the way that accountability functions, especially regarding identifiability and evaluability of both representatives and possible um, policy, policy workers operate. Framing and agenda setting effects of media reports have significant impacts on public deliberation generally, and hence on the ways that officials at all levels are thought to be responsible for policies and outcomes. As an aside then, I wonder how Tony thinks that media organizations can play a mediating role in the value reinforcement or failures to uh, accomplish this, that he thinks champions should engage in? This is an interesting, interesting question, I think, apart from the question of whether we should adopt a deliberative or aggregative model of democracy. This relationship between models of democracy and policy work is even more stark, uh, is seen even more starkly if the view of democracy is more purely aggregative. The deep contrast between such a view of democracy's operation and legitimacy and the deliberative model is manifest in the attitudes both representatives and policy workers would take toward electoral outcomes and corresponding policy development. For on the aggregative model, such outcomes are purely the result of interest group competition where majority power can be seen through the lens of maximizing a social welfare function. Accountability values attached to questions of whether representatives and by extension policy workers effectively carry out policies that reflect the dominant interest of the constituencies that put them in office. The idea of conditional representation that Tony develops also fits here in that representatives uh, can speculate about constituents' real interests given correctives of greater information in response to contingencies that such representatives can have access to. In working out his normative thesis concerning responsible value reinforcement, Tony says that he relies on a Hobbesian model of the state a model that stresses the supreme power of the state's sovereign authority, as well as the way that states represent the citizenry as a whole, as a body politic. This also fits well with the aggregative account in that the legitimacy of state authority on this view rests on the collective self-interested rationality of the voters who contracted to put the authority in place. But Hobbes, who clearly is no Democrat, brings other assumptions about citizen motivation and the limits of sovereign authority that would be of interest here. Because it is assumed in this model that citizens are fundamentally self-interested and non-cooperative, except for strategic reasons. Um, and the only consistent, uh, the only contract consistent with their collective rationality is one that gives unchecked authority to that sovereign. And the contract is not between citizens and the sovereign, or who could enforce such a contract. It is among the citizens themselves. This means that representative, uh, the representative function of state authority is checked only by the conscience of those in power. In Hobbes's words, in foro interno, the accountability that actual democratic representatives have to their constituents in um, analyses of the sort Tony puts forward is much more stringent than Hobbes would allow. More importantly, seeing democratic institutions uh, as basically preference maximizing structures, as aggregative models tend to do, 
will mean that the complementarity thesis Tony defends will have a rather different shape than it would under a deliberative model. For the values of transparency and public debate that he mentions as central to representative democracy would need to be seen in purely instrumental terms, namely how well these characteristics of democratic systems allow voter preferences, subjectively understood and individualist individualistically formed, to manifest themselves maximally in election outcomes. There is no assumption, for example, that public debate plays a dynamic function in helping citizens adapt to the ideas and contrasting perspectives of their compatriots, as deliberative frameworks emphasize. Um, clearly, I'm talking about democratic theory at a highly, uh, formulated at a highly idealized level, um, and my description is quite bare bones about them. But in an argument that stresses how organs of public administration cannot avoid facing substantive value questions in exercising whatever discretion their governance structures allows them, surely there will, there will be disagreement about exactly what values adhere in, democrat, in institu democratic institutions and practices. Democratic theory and the philosophical arguments carried out there should be relevant in fully articulating such values, or at least offering somewhat sophisticated ways of justifying them to various publics that might live by their light. Now, I'm sure whether I've understood Tony's, uh, I'm unsure whether I've understood Tony's subtle and complex theory well enough to be convincing in these suggestions, namely that different theories of democracy push the dynamics of trade-offs about the relation, trade-offs that he describes in differing directions. But I offer it as a provocation for further conversation um, about the relation but among theoretical debates, governing structures, the dynamics of politics, and the operation of the administrative state. Tony's contributions to our understanding of those dynamics is important and timely. So I hope these reflections do nothing to distract us from the value of that work. Thank you. Thank you, John. Tony? Well, thank you all for coming. And I wanna thank the Rock Ethics Institute and the School of Public Policy for making this event possible. Um, to thank Dean Lang for his kind words. But we're all indebted to Ben Jones for putting all of the necessary pieces together, both in the months preceding this event and here on the stage. Um, thanks also to Whitney Sheridan for her, all of her work publicizing the event and making our hybrid format possible. And I can't thank my distinguished colleagues enough for their thoughtful engagement of the, with the ideas of my book. But while listening to a few of these comments, I was reminded of something that the inimitable baseball manager, Casey Stengel, then managing the Boston Bees said to his barber, don't cut my throat. I may want to do that later myself. In all seriousness, the kinds of comments that you've just heard are one reason why I've written this book and, and they're why I invited Leanne, John and Sean in particular to discuss it with us. Public administration cannot be studied only by those interested in how organizations are managed. The politics of public administration is an essential component of a broader politics that everyone on this stage considers in their own work and in their own way. I think that discussions within the field of public administration rarely reach questions of democracy administered from as many perspectives as we have heard tonight. We need much more of this. These comments will be a great help as I move forward with this, with this research program. Well, I could spend the next hour engaging my colleagues on what they have said. I, I'll respond briefly in three ways so as to hear more of the thoughts and concerns of all of you. I'll also try to be a bit provocative to enhance the, the discussion. First, the notion of policy workers, and I use that term to capture the reality that bureaucrats paid by the government are far from the only people implementing public policies, are part of the awesome power of the state is not just my view. It is the view of many institutional designers or champions across time and across political jurisdictions. To take just one example, as the New Deal unfolded, a fear of the power of administrative action was thick in the air. A bill was proposed that would have subjected essentially all policy work to review in the courts. The legal scholar Walter Gellhorn remembered the argument of one of the bill's co-sponsors as follows. 
we're just trying to end this ungodly combination of judge, jury, and prosecutor. We're seeking to require due process. Now, who could be against that? Many of our institutional arrangements seek to limit the power of public administration. And with sufficient mechanisms of control, coalitions of elected representatives can guide policymaking by unelected policy workers. But the tools used for control may at the same time suppress the very benefit of the expertise that the policy workers bring. They are not whippersnappers, but food scientists, engineers, and economists. Control might make the public administration less capable of addressing the problems of the people. For some champions and scholars in my field, this means that the policy worker must be given more latitude, that they be trusted to base their actions on the right values, a public service ethos, and obligation in forno, in terno. My book is concerned about the source of these values. Democracy, John reminds us of this, is government by all of the people. Democratic theorists can come to different conclusions about who the people are, those affected by policy work, those subjected to it, only citizens. But it is clear that the people are not just the policy workers. The people are not just some subgroup of individuals small enough to have a real deliberation that guides policy work and so on. That the panelists and I might agree wholesale with those policy workers or that mini public about a specific housing policy does not make for a democratic outcome. That our collective agreement is based on some solid evidence might give us an argument to, as Christina Lafont has put it, shortcut democracy. In this case, by doing what we think all the people would want us to do, if they knew all that we know about the problems of housing and the policy tools available to address them. And the media just might help us to do this. But the end cannot justify the means, can it? I argue in the book that we need to be clear about what values are, what the values of our representative democracy we give up when we choose a specific shortcut. This is what I've called the champion's dilemma and what Sean has replaced with an even more memorable term. Second, in the book, I want to say, I, I say that I want to consider the institutions of representative democracy as they are rather than as they ought to be. And I wanna be clear about the implications of, of this. Um, it's, it's a part of the comments that, that, uh, that each of, our panelists have given, and and I think it is I think it is something that 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 is really important to stress. While a specific democratic theory might give a champion the rationale to structure policy work so as to enhance quality or fairness or any other value, that structure might conflict with values baked into the representative government that policy workers are meant to serve. Context matters political jurisdictions have different institutional arrangements. Those arrangements bake in different values and priorities among values. Spanish representative government is not Japanese representative government. Should Spanish policy workers use their discretion to promote the same ordering of values that Japanese policy workers do? A democratic theory might tell us in no uncertain terms that the better answer is the one baked into the Japanese institutions. The rule of law may then land a Spanish policy worker in jail or subject to heavy fines for listening to that advice. Could we conclude that the Spanish policy worker's responsibility is to violate Spanish law? Of course not, but that is because context matters. Lastly, my, my comments thus far have brought us to the role of the policy worker in all of this. This, this book was published last year and I've had a the chance to do a lot of thinking about the value reinforcement thesis since then. Indeed, another essay written with the political philosopher Lindsay Schwartz is now forthcoming as a short book. It develops a democratic theory underlying the complementary, complementary principle that I state in democracy administered and relieves us from some of the, the structure of that represent or retrospective model that, uh, that a few of these, these uh, um, comments have have uh, centered on. 
In that book, we address two problems with important democratic content that all policy workers can face. We call the first the problem of roles. What policy workers can do in the interest of justice or fairness or any other value in their official capacities is and should be constrained by the spirit and the letter of the law and by the values of the system which they care, in which they carry out their duties. What that same person may permissibly do in the interest of justice or fairness and so forth in their capacity as a civilian or a member of society is and ought not to be so constrained. Resolving this problem might lead a policy worker to quit her job and to rail against the very policy she was charged with in, in, implementing now as a civilian. That advocacy may change society for the better, but if the constraints of her role as a policy worker did not allow for meaningful change, the right road to policy change begins with the responsible decision to quit. A second problem, which we call the problem of levels, can be described like this. Policy workers are charged with enacting policies that can affect people's lives for better or worse. Consequently, they must routinely make value judgments about how best to achieve the aims of their offices in ways that are to the public good. Absent guidance as to how to prioritize or adjudicate between competing values, policy workers must make these routine judgments at their own un unguided discretion. And doing so might mean doing irresponsible policy work. To resolve the problem, the policy worker might have to engage those at the level of representative government that can congeal the wants of the public into the aims of the public in this sort of aggregative conception. Those representatives or political superiors may be persuaded. The problem of roles might not be reached and the policy worker may stay in her job. The responsible thing in this instance is for her to have those discussions and to try to shape those views for the betterment of society. While governance structures that set up the problem of roles and levels are in an important sense conservative with a small c, I contend that it is the values of the system that they conserve, not any particular policy. If those system values become problematic, as, as several of you have discussed, they should, and indeed they must be reshaped. Institutional change is and must be possible. And Sean and Leanne have both discussed mechanisms for institutional change, and I would endorse both of those mechanisms. But for the reasons I have stated, I don't think a revolution ought to be brought about by the bureaucracy. Do you? Thanks, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Tony. Um, thank you for that incredibly rich discussion. So we're now going to open it up uh, for your questions and perspectives. If you are in the audience, just come up here to one of the mics. If you're watching via Zoom, you can ask a question via um, the chat function or the Q&A function. Uh, thanks so much for this. This makes me want to run out and uh, get the book, which I'll do. But my question also reflects the fact that I haven't read the book, though I've learned a great bit about it from uh, the panelists. So uh, if my question is off base, uh, then please just ignore it. Uh, uh, but uh, it strikes me uh, that uh, to the extent that uh, there is space in what I you know, bureaucratic or administrative decision making for values to come into play. Um, American administrative law has told a story about that for the last several decades, uh, and the story's gotten sort of stronger. And that is, uh, there's a figure who hasn't figured in the cast of characters, as I've heard it related, which is the executive uh, that plays a role uh, in uh, shaping how administrative officials down the line will exercise that discretion in accordance with the values that that executive uh, rings uh, into office. And this kind of famously in um, the United States uh, in the Chevron uh, decision um, is the grounds for our courts to stand down when there's space in the law that could be interpreted one way or another. Uh, courts will uh, let the executive kind of choose how to do it in the pursuit of an agenda uh, that in a sense is ratified by an electorate. 
um, because the, the um, executive was elected. Um, how do you feel about that narrative? What's the role for, for this for value space to be kind of dictated from, from on high? Uh, and um, yeah, uh, where does that uh, account sort of fall down if it does? Thank you, Judd. Well, thanks a lot, Judd. I, it's so you, you, in doing that, you bring up, a, so one response is that in the book, I talk about representatives in such a way that I include in that character, the elected executive, right? So in the United States, when we have such a directly exec, elected executive and the president, um, I'm talking about a similar kind of thing. And I'm talking about that space being possible. In what I had to say much later in talking about the problem of levels, that once again invokes this, this problem of the political executive. It may be that I, in the, in the Department of Defense, don't really have the authority to do something that I think is really important to do. It's not then incumbent upon, it's my, my responsible action can't be to do that anyway. My only, my only avenue for responsible action can't be to quit the agency. So it is that, that notion of being able to go to the, to the appropriate level and to understand that, right? If at that point I can't resolve the problem, then, then I find myself in that problem of roles um, where you know, I, I might have to leave in order to, in order to uh, implement these, these kinds of values. I will say though, one, one thing that you bring up that, I, that I've written down and, and should think a bit more about is the way that you described Chevron allowing the values to be set in some way by the political executives themselves, right? To the extent that a political executive has control over the the, the values that get baked into an agency, something that shows up in Leanne's work um, in, the, in the book about uh, um, feminists in the bureaucracy, right? The, the EPA has some values baked into it, right? And the EPA is a really interesting case institutionally. It's one of those, one of those agencies that has, a, that has a sort of strange form, right? It's not, in, it, it's not entirely independent. Right, but it's a bit more independent than, say, the Department of Labor, and so, so there's, there's, uh, there's, there's something interesting about that. To the extent that the president can shape that himself, that is a stronger authority than, say, that, than one might see and uh, uh, yeah, than one might expect, and that would differ across agencies. Um, and so that that's actually that's actually a it's a highlight of an institutional arrangement that's that's worth that's worth thinking about, and I will do that. Thanks. Does anyone else want to head on? Yeah, I, I thought that's that's a really interesting angle, and um, I'm not uh, you know legal scholar, but my understanding of Chevron is that you know it says if Congress Tony Tony is so. <laughs> uh, if, uh, if Congress has, has specified a clear statutory interpretation, an agency has to use it. And if they haven't, but the agencies is reasonable, a court will defer to them. Yep. yep. So they're not asking, did the president tell you to do, uh, the pre like the executive does not enter in, as I understand it, to a court's interpretation or application of the Chevron test. It, you know, it just says, you know, if Cong I mean, if Congress controlled it, you know, you're done. And if it's rational, we're done, you know, and we're at, so, so it still allows, I think, uh, a significant exercise of administrative discretion. And if the president can insert him or herself into that process to control administrators, good for them, that's administrative politics, but the court's not going to be the one to enforce it. Am I right about that? I think. I, so the court does talk a bit about I see, I see. Mm. Is it relevant to add that Chevron is under threat? Yeah, I, I was I was actually <laughs> yeah. I was actually gonna bring that bring that up. Okay. You know, one thing that's sort of 
hovering over all this in the American case is that we, we have a decision in the last term that, that makes us think that unless Congress is extremely specific about what it tells an administrative agency to do, the administrative agency then couldn't do that. This gets, this is, so theoretically for those of us on this, on this, uh, behind this table, this is really problematic because for, for Sean, this is getting a lot closer to trying to specify a complete contract. And given that that's not possible, there's going to be, there's going to be some consequence of trying to do that, right? And that, that consequence might be, if we're thinking about policy outcomes, it might be, as I, as I briefly said, in the, in the notion of the capacity of the state to do certain things. That might be the policy, that might be the outcome that, that certain parties want. Let's just not do as much policy output. But you do, there, there are trade-offs, of course, and I'm, I'm gonna be the one to you know, defend that those trade-offs are going to be, um, are going to be significant. So, so I think that, that that is a concern, right? That maybe the administrative state in, you know, you're able to think about what an administrative, what, what a policy worker in my, in my language can and ought to do with their discretion. And if that discretion is narrowed somehow, that's exactly the kind of forced trade-off that I'm, that I'm thinking about. If this comes from the courts and the way in which this operates is to create a kind of risk aversion for agencies and rulemaking or any number of things that we might come to expect, the 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 influence could be could be pretty significant. Am I am I wrong about any of that? We need so, to do I'll oh, go ahead. I mean it's actually a question to Tony. So do you yeah. think then in a case where Chevron is overturned that you lose the opportunity to do the value that you talk about in the bill? Or I, it, can that be baked in another way? I would I would I would hope that you don't because you still have an amount of discretion. But the the impact of your being able to do the value reinforcement, right? And you, to, to be able to engage in the kind of behavior that I call responsible, that impact on policy, that impact on, on uh, the way in which, as, as you pointed out, people perceive democracy because the, you know, the public administration is in part doing these things that, that help it out. Um, that, that that may be reduced, right? I don't know, um, but just by reducing the amount of discretion that you have and the way that the way that um, policy workers sort of react to that reduction of discretion might lead them to choices that that are maybe narrower than we want to in all of these in all of these ways, including the value. Let me just, Whitney, do we have any uh, uh, take, John? Okay, Jonathan. Uh, thank you so much. Fascinating Thanks. panel. I must confess, like John, I haven't read the book, but it's on my list too. So again, um, two points. First of all, uh, the idea of there being no free lunch. I mean, I say to my students all the time, you open the fridge for breakfast in the morning and you're making value judgments. You're doing something which has ethical implications and ergo, it must be the same, obviously, all the more so for those charged with administrative, administering public policy. But what I wanted to talk about was, and this will be no shock to John, who knows my work, is what seems to me to be the elephant in the room. I was waiting for how long it would take for us to get to West Virginia, the West Virginia EPA case. And of course, that decision is really important because it protects and it promotes the interests of somebody, of, of a part of the political system we have not mentioned explicitly, which are private, powerful corporate actors who have all sorts of influence on in public policy. I know of a dear friend whose uncle worked in the Pennsylvania Department of the Environment. And every time a fracking permit application came on his desk, it was whipped away, taken up to his superior to make sure the right answer came back. And he could not afford to leave his position because he was coming up for retirement. So he couldn't stand on principle and quit because he feared he was gonna lose his pension. So 
I think to me, what hangs over all this are the many, many ways in which powerful corporate actors influence the process. We talked about, I've heard many on the panel talk about how we select in the US our political representatives. Larry Lessig's hypothesis is we don't select. The selection is done in advance by powerful corporate actors. And we simply pick amongst those that have already been selected for us. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about the threats that private actors uh, present to the system as you articulated. And it seems to me a very idealized system and they are in shaping their framing, <laughs> they're distorting agendas. And as we've seen, they are having an impact in profound ways, not just in the decision we have in uh, West, West Virginia EPA case, but I'd love to hear you say more about how we address that threat. To, uh, the process. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thanks. I'll I'll say a couple of uh, I'll say a couple of things. And the first is sort of to kind of raise a question. There are a lot of powerful interests, not just corporate interests, right? So so in a sense, this notion of of interest group politics being something that takes over the the the, the sort of the democratic expression of the wants of the public and so on and so forth. That, that is definitely a problem for the political system. Where, and this, this is undoubtedly going to be a controversial um, answer to this, where the, the claim that I make is that it's, it's not the bureaucracy's job to fix those problems with electoral democracy, with with the with representative democracy at a constitutional level because the consequences of doing that could be could be profound right bureaucrats including the person that you mentioned who was in in a position to to make a decision on a permit if that person had decided simply to sabotage those those permits uh, as a as a matter of principle, or to do something else that would have that would have precipitated a kind of revolution from within the bureaucracy that would have precipitated a, a change in the value structure. Even if we agree with those kinds of things, how would we feel if the other party was in charge? How would we feel if the if those were not promoting a good outcome that we have? And those are those are really the those are really the concerns that that I have. And I think when Sean was saying these things go to the sort of heart of public administration, it's always something that's difficult for for us to grapple with. The machine produces a bad answer. How do we trust the the machine when it produces that that kind of bad answer? And the and the book is written kind of from that perspective. And this this sort of the 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 second um, short book that I that I talked about really tries to say that sometimes you know this value reinforcement is going to be reinforcing values that are, you know, maybe we objectively would really like to change, right? But it's it's difficult to argue that it's the it's the policy workers who should be making who should be making that change and i think in response to your in response to your your comment that directly whether that influence whether it, it doesn't really matter who perceives these policies as as good or bad right the corporate interests are powerful and their perception of a bad outcome may actually change the bureaucratic behavior, right? That, that's just as problematic as someone else's perception that changes the bureaucratic behavior from within. That's what I'm, that's what I'm talking about with this sort of, the, I, 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 I don't feel comfortable with the idea from a, of a revolution from within the bureaucracy. I hope that's, I hope that makes some sense. Come back very quickly. It's interesting you framed the saboteur. You framed the saboteur, the person who felt like, you know, he wanted to intervene, but he couldn't, was doing his job. Whereas on another view, the saboteur is the boss who's uh, Precisely right. controlling the process. Precisely right. And both of them, 
are involved in this in this situation, right? So is the boss that you described being responsible? I wouldn't think so. I mean, were I writing a case about that person in this in this situation, I would not, I would not, um, I would not pass. I, I, I don't think I would come down given what I see that 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 person would be responsible. But all of those all of those questions, I think, have to be asked and when we step back and say, what kind of system would we want? Um, I'd have to say, in due respect and deference to your to this person who is a longtime public servant, whom I don't know, you know, I, I'm I don't know that I necessarily trust their particular interpretation of the values of this state uh, over the elected officials who, you know, made this policy. It's, it's just not obvious to me. Is it fracking damaging? Yeah, it's bad. Does it have potential benefits to people in this state? Yeah, let's not kid ourselves. You know, and, um, uh, and, and does it have important geopolitical implications at this particular moment? Sure. And any one of these things could be used to cloak an administrator's sense of the good in, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, advancing the value of society. You mentioned the, the potential failures of the democratic process, which are very real. Uh, values and failures that are very close at hand to all of uh, to us as individuals are a belief that we speak for others when we really don't, and that we see things as good. We see things as very straightforward when they're really not. Um, and I don't know how to constitute, you know, a resolution of those trade-offs other than through institutions that bring people together and say. You know, if the press process is broken, it has to be fixed through this process. You have to bootstrap it through this process. So I, it, it isn't, even this case is not straightforward to me. I know it's a total heresy, I understand. But I have the luxury of getting on a plane tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great discussion. We're, we're almost at time. I want to, there's a question from our online audience I want to get to to close us. Thank you. 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 Several people are asking where they can purchase the book. Oh. Um, you, you, you can purchase the book from your favorite bookseller, <laughs> Cambridge University Press directly, Amazon.com, whether you like them or not. <laughs> and so forth. Yes. I do want to note there's a really nice comment here that says, for a member of the public, thank you for watching. Thank you. I really thank you. Um, well, thank you everyone for joining us for this discussion tonight. Thank you to our panelists. Can we have a round of applause for them? And if you're interested, get a copy of the book if you want to explore these topics more. Thank you. <laughs>